Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for being here. I always love coming to Hungary. I love Budapest. I love Hungarian people. I love Hungarian hackers, because there's great Hungarian hackers. There's actually many great Hungarian hackers in the audience right now. And I know there are great Hungarian hackers because I've, I've worked with several Hungarian hackers. I worked, I sit right next to one great Hungarian hacker for 10 years, Peter Zur, who used to work for me um, for years and years in Finland, who's nowadays living in the United States. And he, he taught me so much about reverse engineering and, and malware analysis and building, building security that lasts. So it's, it's really good to be here. Of course, we're also um, distant relatives. Everybody keeps telling me Finnish language and Hungarian language are related. Which means I can do the rest of the presentation in Finnish, mikä on todella hieno juttu, voidaan keskustella tästä koko loppupäivän. Ymmärrätte varmasti, mitä tarkoitan. But I'll actually speak about cyber arms race. Not about cyber war. About cyber arms race. Because I don't like the word cyber war. And I don't like the word cyber war because it's drastically overused. Every time something happens, there's like a break-in into some large company or a denial of service attack or what have you. You'll see the headlines about cyber war. Estonia 2007, cyber war. Stuxnet attack against the centrifuges in Iran, cyber war. Attacks against South Korea, cyber war. Those aren't cyber war. They can't be cyber war, because those things aren't part of any war. How could Stuxnet be an act of war if the attackers, who were United States and Israel, never declared a war on Iran? And if they aren't part of a war, we shouldn't call them war. Because if we keep calling these things war and cyber war, we'll just cause unnecessary inflation to the term. And we will be needing this term for real one day. Unfortunately, we will most likely end up having conflicts and crises and wars between technically advanced nations. And if we are to have wars today between technically advanced nations, those wars will definitely have online attacks as part of the warfare. There will be traditional kinetic attacks, but there will obviously today also be online attacks, cyber attacks, if you will. And then those will be something we will want to call cyber war. But we haven't seen that yet, despite what the headlines will tell you. Now, I strongly believe that you have no hope of defending your networks or defending your organization if you don't understand who you are defending against. You have to understand your enemy. You have to understand who is going to attack you? Who are they? Where are they from? Why are they attacking you? What's the motive? If you understand that, then you can start building defense because it's totally different trying to defend yourself and your organization against a hobbyist who does attacks for fun. And it's totally different to attack yourself against a criminal organization who wants to steal your money. And it's totally different to defend your organization against Anonymous, who wants to attack you to make a point. And once again, it's totally different to try to defend yourself against a governmental attacker who wants to break into your system to gain access to your data for espionage purposes. So you have to think about the threat level. And most organizations, let's say a local restaurant here in Budapest, a normal company like that will never be attacked by a governmental attacker. Why? Because there's nothing worth stealing. A governmental attacker isn't going to attack a pizza place in Budapest because they are not a target for APT attacks because there's nothing worth stealing. Criminals will attack a pizza place in Budapest because they want money and a pizza place has money. They have payment systems, they pay salaries, they use online banking, they have card data. Sure, they will be attacked. So you have to think about the attacker. And you can group these attackers into different groups. The basic grouping, which is actually very similar to what Charlie was saying in the previous talk, is that you have the criminals, they want to make money, 
Then you have hacktivists who don't want to make money, who want to make a political statement or who want to protest maybe. And then you have the governmental attackers. And there are smaller groups as well, like the old school hackers who aren't really, who actually don't have a motive at all. They just do it for fun. Or extremists or terrorists, which also exist, but they're very small. We don't really see much activity from them. And you can split this further. For example, the governmental attackers. We have different parts of governments today launching online attacks. For example, we have the police. In many countries now around the world, law enforcement are using backdoors and Trojans and exploits to break into the computers of their own citizens. I don't know about the law here, but for example, where I'm from in Finland, starting on January 1st, the Finnish police gets the legal right to infect my computer with malware if I'm suspected of a serious crime. Which is really weird, because I mean, we work with the police all the time to work on online investigations and to find virus writers and online criminals. And now the very same guys that I work with are actually going to be deploying malware themselves, which is really weird. And this happens in many countries. It happens in the United States, happens in the United Kingdom, happens in the Netherlands, happens in Germany. So it's the police, which is one part of the governmental attacks. Then we have the intelligence agencies, the spies. And we have to, um, it's actually fairly easy to see why people who do espionage want to do espionage online. Because espionage is spying, and spying is the act of collecting information. And information has changed. I mean, information used to be something on a piece of paper, right? Information used to look like this. And if you wanted to get this information, you had to come to me and steal the paper from me or copy the paper, right? You had to physically come to where the information was. But today, of course, information doesn't look like this. Information is data. It's on our computers. It's on our networks, which means the information is now reachable from basically anywhere in the world. You don't have to come to the information anymore physically. You can just reach it through online networks. And that's why we see so much APTs. We see so much online activity from intelligence agencies. And then we have, of course, the military, who are building cyber capability, a credible cyber offensive capability to be used in future crises. And one problem militaries have in this cyber arms race, if you will, is that they have to stockpile weaponized exploits for a possible crisis. And they, of course, don't want to use them unless, unless there really is a crisis. So they basically build a stockpile of weapons, which they keep in their, in, 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 in the, at their disposal. But the problem with exploits, exploits is that they rot. They go bad. They sort of have an expiry date, like your milk. Right? Eventually, the great exploit which you have um, waiting in your, uh, in, in your, uh, uh, at your disposal, in a year or two years, it won't work anymore. Why? Because your potential targets keep changing their systems. They update their systems, they upgrade, they find the vulnerability, they patch it, or they upgrade to a newer operating system or platform. So you constantly have to keep fresh exploits at your disposal. And this creates a concrete market need for fresh exploits. And we are already seeing a niche market, a new market for guns for hires appearing. Basically companies which specialize in just finding fresh exploits and selling them to militaries around the world. And the funny thing about that is that there really isn't much um, rules on how that's being done. For example, there are international rules on exporting weapons, like real world weapons, like guns and fighter jets. For example, you can't export weapons to some countries, or you typically can't export weapons to countries which are in the middle of a war, for example. Or it depends a little bit. But there are no such restrictions on exporting exploits. And there probably should be. So let's talk about this guy for a while. His name is Shatoshi Nakamoto. He's a mathematician. Almost five years ago, he published a groundbreaking genius mathematical paper. Paper in which he describes something that he calls a blockchain. And he describes this peer-to-peer -peer network which maintains this blockchain, doing these complicated mathematical things on the blockchain, which can then be used to create a currency, 
a currency based on math, a crypto currency, a virtual currency. And the paper was titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And I know many of you here have Bitcoins or know about Bitcoins. And Bitcoin is a very good example on how the landscape is changing, especially regarding um, the criminal attackers, the ones who want to make money. Well, why would criminals be interested in a virtual, untraceable, anonymous virtual currency? Well, of course, they're interested in an anonymous, virtual, untraceable currency. And Bitcoin, since it has been so much in the news, the value of Bitcoin has been fluctuating wildly. In January this year, one Bitcoin cost you $8. Today, it's $130 or $140. So the value has skyrocketed. It plummeted 15% two weeks ago when Silk Road was taken down in the um, hidden web uh, under Tor. Because big part, well, all the payments in, uh, in, in Silk Road were done in Bitcoins. But it has recovered already. And since the value has been growing, people really got interested in Satoshi himself. Like, who is this guy? Who invented this thing? And because the biggest invention Satoshi did was solving the two main problems there are with any virtual currency. Problem number one, how do you confirm the transaction? Problem number two, how do you inject new currency into the system without causing an inflation? And the way he solved these problems was that he joined the problems. So when I'm moving money in Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, for example, when I'm wiring money, let's say to Baldi, sitting right there. I'm wiring Bitcoins to Baldi, right? The way it's confirmed, because there are no central banks to confirm it, is that everyone else who's using the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network confirms the transaction between us. But why would anybody do that? Because it's really quite costly to do that. You have to have your computer running and doing these complicated mathematical calculations on our transaction to confirm it. Why would anyone else confirm our transactions? And the answer is they do it because the algorithm rewards the other members of the peer-to-peer -peer network for confirming our transaction by giving them free bitcoins. This is the way new currency is injected into the network. So if you confirm other people's transactions, you get, as a salary, free bitcoins. This is called mining. And when you're doing mining, you're not just calculating complicated calculations in vain. You're actually confirming other people's transactions, making the network more secure. Great idea. Who comes up with these ideas? Who is this guy? So people wanted to speak to Satoshi and interview Satoshi. And when they tried to reach to him, they realized that he doesn't exist. <coughs> there is no Satoshi Nakamoto. There never was. We don't know who invented Bitcoin. It's sort of like alien technology, like somebody landed here and like dropped <laughs> this algorithm to us, which is really weird. Now, when Bitcoin was, er, uh, when, when, in the early days of Bitcoin, when Bitcoin was very cheap, like a couple of cents a Bitcoin, um, people got the smart idea that they could just do mining, uh, not just to confirm transactions, but to just earn money, mine Bitcoins and, and, and make money. And since it was so cheap, um, it was almost impossible. But if you took a really cheap old PC, you know, the cheapest you could get, and leave it running for half a year, it would make, make maybe $10 or $15, a little bit of money. But then this price started getting bigger and bigger. And when it hit like $50, people really got interested in it. They started building more serious systems. It still looks like shit, right? <laughs> but that's 10 NVIDIA high-end GPUs crunching away, it's sitting in somebody's basement. Yeah. But it's now making, you know, hundreds of dollars. Hmm. And of course, today you can go and buy a custom-built ASIC-based mining rig, which costs you $30,000, right? And it can be used to do nothing except mine bitcoins. And by the way, it pays itself back, typically. Well, depends on the difficulty level. In the spring, if you would buy one of these, it would pay itself back in two weeks. Think about that. $30,000 rig pays itself back in two weeks. That's weird. And this, of course, brings the obvious conclusion, which is, if you can make money by mining bitcoins, you need a powerful machine. But it doesn't have to be your own machine. You can do the mining on someone else's machine. You can do the mining in botnets. And that's exactly what we started seeing around a year ago. Botnets which were starting to monetize the infected machines, not by using keyloggers to steal credit card numbers or passwords, not by using ransom trojans, not by uh, online banking fraud, but by using the computers to do mining, mining bitcoins. And this is interesting. Because this basically means 
that attackers who use miners like a silent miner, which is a botnet or a com botnet component sold in the underworld that you can use to turn your existing botnet into a mining botnet making money, these botnets are actually beneficial, sort of beneficial, at least benevolent. And what I mean by that is that if you're a victim of infection, if your computer gets infected and it's a banking trojan, it's going to steal your money. If it's a keylogger, it's going to steal your password. If it's a keylogger, it's going to steal your credit card number. If it's a ransom trojan, it's going to lock my PC. I can't access my data. However, if it's a Bitcoin mining trojan or any cryptocurrency mining trojan, it's not going to steal anything from me. It's going to steal a few cycles from my CPU. There's a little bit of electricity. Nothing I could actually probably calculate. And it's actually beneficial for the rest of the Bitcoin users because it's actually going to be confirming transactions for other users, making the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network transactions faster and more secure. It's actually a botnet which creates more security for the users of the cryptocurrency, which is really, really weird. We have actually have never seen anything like this. It doesn't attack the user. It attacks the PC, it's the CPU. Anything that has a CPU and an IP address can now make money on its own without the user. And this has further implications. For example, um, we all know that computers are coming everywhere, into our appliances, into our well, watches. I have a pebble here. My watch has a CPU and an IP address, right? They're coming into your fridges, into your toasters, into your cars. You want to learn more about cars with computers? Watch Charlie's talk from DEF CON. These things will now change the way attackers can make money. If there are fridges and microwave ovens and toasters which have a CPU, which have an IP address, like why would anybody infect them? Why would anybody write a piece of malware for toasters? Like why? No reason. Somebody would do it for fun, maybe. But you know, otherwise, there's really no reason why anybody would infect toasters except with attacks like this. Because they don't need a user. They just need processing power. And obviously, one toaster isn't going to have a lot of processing power. But if you have a million infected toasters, they do. They won't be able to mine bitcoins because bitcoins really need a GPU to do something useful. But there are tons of competing cryptocurrencies like Litecoin and Zerocoin and others. And frankly, I'm not sure if bitcoin will be the currency to change the world. I think it's going to be one of the clones of bitcoin, maybe. But this really does change the whole threat um, scenario. And we actually did a little bit of calculation on this, because the largest botnet on the planet right now is Configure, which is six years old, not very interesting. The second largest botnet on the planet is Zero Access, developed by a guy called Ringo, or Ring Zero, from, from near Moscow. And this botnet used to monetize itself with click fraud and spam. Last spring, they changed completely and started doing the whole monetization by mining bitcoins on the infected machines. And we did a little bit of back of envelope calculations on how much money the zero access botnet would be making with Bitcoin mining. In spring, when they were doing this, the, dif the Bitcoin difficulty level was much lower than it is today. Today, they won't be making as much as our calculations showed. But in spring, we estimate they were making $58,000 a day. $58,000 a day by mining Bitcoins and um, uh, using infected machines around the world to do that for them. And that's $58,000 tax free, by the way. So I don't think they're paying taxes on this. So that clearly is an example on how the criminal element is really monitoring and paying attention and looking for new kinds of opportunities. And we will see similar, um, similar things in the future as well. Another interesting thing that has been really affecting the landscape for the criminals has been the launch of the widespread ransom trojans, where the attacks don't try to steal money from your bank account or from your credit card account. They will lock your system or encrypt your system and demand payment from, from you in order to make money. And they typically don't straight off tell you that, hello, I'm a Trojan, pay me and you'll get your PC back. Typically, they play sort of, sort of games with the user. They pretend to be someone else, typically the police. So your PC gets locked and it claims to be FBI, Department of Defense, USA Cybercrime Center. They found illegal content from your hard drive, MP3 files, movie torrents, illegal porn, and now you have to pay a fine. And of course, almost everybody's like, oh shit, yes, I had some MP3s on my hard drive. How did they find out? Now I have to pay a fine. 
well, people, some people fall for this. Even more interesting, they do this very locally. I mean, they, they use GeoIP to figure out where you are, and then they will change the message depending on your country. So, for example, if you get hit by the very same Trojan, but you're in France, it speaks French. Or in the Netherlands, it's Dutch. In Poland, it's Polish. What do you think about uh, here in Hungary? Well, here we go. <laughs> it's incredible. They even do it in, in Finnish. Um, but even more interesting is that if you go to Greek, they even do it in the Greek language for the Greeks, which makes no sense because they don't have any money anymore. <laughs> and then there's another alternative version of this, um, which we saw in June, right after the Snowden leaks started, where it claimed to be NSA. And your system has been locked by this PRISM program, which you might have heard of. And of course, it's once again a scam. Then we have the different attackers, the governmental attackers, um, the targeted attacks that we have been monitoring for 10 years now. We started seeing the first APTs around 2003, 2004. And the stereotypical APT is the one where you, the target, receive an email from someone you know and trust, typically sent in your own language, speaking about real things, real projects, and there is a document file attached, like a Word doc file or a PDF file, and you trust the message, you know the sender, you click on the attachment, and it has an exploit which drops a backdoor, infects your system, and then shows you a real document on screen so you believe everything to be okay. That's the archetype. We've seen many variations. Today we see more and more so-called watering hole attacks because email is harder and harder to use in attacks like this. So instead of trying to get you through email attachments, they will just infect the website they know you will most likely visit. Let's say you're a project developer working with uh, a defense contractor working on high explosives. There are high explosive discussion forums where you might be going. So they can just hack a PHP piece site, which is really easy to do, and wait for you to go there and drop the exploit from there. They will get lots of other people as well, but they will get you. So this guy here is Alfred Nobel. Speaking about high explosives, he's the guy who invented dynamite. Then he got bad feelings about it later when he was getting older because dynamite was being used in wars to kill people so he started a prize that's rewarded annually for people who are improving peace this is known as the Nobel Peace Prize which will be given today by the way in Oslo two years ago the Nobel Peace Prize was given to this guy Liu Xiaobo a Chinese dissident who famously did not get to pick up his peace prize because he was under house arrest in Beijing. This here is the Nobel Peace Prize website, nobelpeaceprize.org, which, for example, today is going to have a lot of traffic because everybody wants to find out who got the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't even know if they already gave it. They might have actually given it just now. Two years ago, when Liu Xiaobo won the Nobel Peace Prize, this website got hacked. Two days after it was announced that a Chinese dissident will get the Peace Prize, someone hacked this website. They didn't change the website in any way. Instead, they added one line of JavaScript on every single page on this website. And that line of JavaScript used a zero day in Firefox to infect anybody with a backdoor who visited the website with Firefox. This went unnoticed for three days. Then it was noticed by one of the admins on the site. He took down the site. He sent out public warnings about it. He cleaned off the site. He did forensic analysis on how they were breached. He reverse engineered the exploit. He did such a great job in recovering from this breach. In fact, he did such a great job that as a way of saying thanks, he got invited to join the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. Or actually, he got an email inviting him to join the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. An email sent by Alex Gladstein from Oslo Freedom Forum containing an attachment which is an invitation to the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. So, when this was happening, I actually called Alex Gladstein. Um, he's based in New York. I spoke with him on the phone. And he confirmed that, yes, that's his email address. Yes, that is his signature. And yes, that is a real invitation to the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. But no, he never sent this. He did not send this email. And 
This PDF file has an exploit and it drops a backdoor. And now the question becomes, who sent it? Or even better, which country sent this? Which country had the motive? And these are the kinds of cases which over and over again lead the pointing finger to point at China. Who else would have had the motive? And I remembered this case again this year, because in May this year, I received an email from Alex at OsloFreedomForum.com with a PDF attachment. And as you might think, I was like, hmm, all right. So I called Alex again, and we, we spoke on the phone, and he, he, he said, yeah, it's okay, I, I, I just mailed it to you, it's okay. <laughs> and it was okay, it was a clean PDF. I opened it, and it was an invitation to join the Oslo Freedom Forum this year, which was uh, in the beginning of June in Oslo. And I went there. Very interesting thing. It has nothing to do directly with computer security. It's a gathering for freedom fighters, dissidents, people who, who live in countries run by dictators who are fighting against dictatorships. There were people from Iran, people from North Korea, people from Morocco, people from uh, Angola, and so on. Um, the most interesting speaker was from Angola, this guy, Rafael Marquis de Moraes, who's been fighting against the dictatorship in Angola for two decades. He's been beaten up numerous times. In fact, um, he's in jail right now. He was jailed uh, in August, uh, two months after this, this, this event. And during the event, um, there was a workshop for people like him. Like, if you are a dissident living in a dictatorship, how to securely use computers? If you know your government is after you, how do you communicate? If you know that you cannot trust the local ISPs and telcos, how do you encrypt your communication? And during that workshop, uh, Raphael asked if somebody could check his laptop, because he was worried that there might be something on his laptop. He's not a technical expert. He had a Mac, MacBook, OS X. And we looked at it, and guess what? There was a backdoor on his OS X, completely unknown, tailor-made backdoor, which we had never seen before, a backdoor which gave the attacker full access to everything on his system, all his files, get screenshots, have remote control, key lock the keyboard, turn on the microphone and listen to his discussions, everything. Very interesting case. So we made it public. We blocked about this, we shared the samples with the rest of the antivirus industry like we always do. And then I got an email from a colleague of mine from a company called Norman Shark, a guy called Snorre emailed me and said, yeah, this sample is very interesting. They've never seen it before. However, the server where it sends all the stolen information, they have seen that. Because they've been investigating a case which they called an Operation Hangover, where files looking like these, document files, were sent apparently from India to Pakistan, to military personnel in Pakistan, to generals in Pakistan, to politicians in Pakistan, always booby-trapped with exploits dropping backdoors. And they act actually mapped all the samples of where they uh, were sending their, their um, information to, and one of these dots is the same server where Rafael Marquez de Moraes' data was being sent in Angola. And this looked really weird to us, like these attacks in Pakistan, most likely done from India, what do they have to do with this dissident in Africa? Well, we investigated this and it turns out that the software is done by one of these guns for hire, a private company which specializes in writing Trojans and backdoors for governments and selling them whoever pays for attacks like that. So they've been selling these attacks allegedly to the Indian government, allegedly to the Angolan government. And they work. Like I said, Rafael Marquis de Moraes is in jail right now. So the methods governments are using to monitor their own people are changing. The two most important inventions of our generation are the internet and the mobile phone. And these two tools are perfect tools also for governments to do surveillance on us, the citizens. And that's really sad. The best inventions we've had, the things that have brought so much prosperity to us, turn out to be perfect ways of monitoring us as well. 
But of course, there are other attackers as well. It's not just China. It's not just India and Pakistan and Angola. There's attacks coming from Russia. Um, there's attacks coming from the United States. Um, I think it's exactly the same picture that Charlie had in his keynote, got a lot of the Chinese hacking away at their systems. And of course, Chinese attacks were much in the headlines in February this year because of this report done by Mandiant in the United States where they pinpoint this building. This is Unit 61389 in Shanghai, China. And as investigated, um, this is the central location from which uh, many of the APT attacks allegedly launched by Chinese military, the PLA, are launched from. And this was such an interesting story that CNN actually sent a camera crew over to Shanghai to film this location. I actually have a clip about that, so let me, let me show this to you. This is from CNN in February, and what we have <clears throat> is David McKenzie with his camera crew driving by Unit 61389, right there. And as they drive by the PLA building, they also drive by three PLA officers who are walking on the street. And one of the officers looks at the car, and he sees the camera. <laughs> That's not good, right? <laughs> you can sort of see the camera crew going like, shit, right? And then, a second PLA officer starts running as well. <laughs> and now you can imagine the camera crew going, shit, 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 shit. But of course, they are in a car. Those guys are running on foot. How hard is it to just floor it and get away, right? Right? Well, it turns out that these guys are pretty good runners. <laughs> they actually outrun the car. Like, <laughs> I don't know what they feed to officers in China. They sort of look like the Terminator, right? <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. Amazing. Finnish officers don't run like that. <laughs> so okay, what about then other hotspots right now, like Syria, which is in the middle of civil war right now. And we've all heard about the Syrian Electronic Army, which are local hackers supporting the al-Assad regime. Um, they claim to have three divisions within the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, run by different leaders, the most famous of them being a guy who call himself, calls himself Thet Pro. Um, they aren't directly part of the government or part of the military, it's more of like a gang, but they are pretty visible, because they've been attacking various different places, like hacking the front page of the New York Times, which is a pretty big deal, which was done with a DNS hack. They didn't actually gain access to the server, but Nevertheless, and then they gained access to Associated Press Twitter account. And I know what you're thinking, I'm a, it's just Twitter, who the hell cares, right? <laughs> well, it has two million followers. And once they gained access to it, what they tweeted was breaking two explosions in the White House. Barack Obama is injured. And of course, that's scary. I mean, if you're reading Twitter timeline and you're subscribed to AP, well, that's going to scare you. But that's not the point because it's not just us humans reading this Twitter timeline. There are lots of bots reading it as well, especially high-frequency stock trading bots, because 75% of any stock trading done on any major exchange today is done by bots. And these bots will follow financial news and stock news for any company. And if there's a stock release, they try to parse what it's saying and whether that's positive or negative, and they make automatic trades very quickly before anyone else can do it. And they also follow general news. And they are not very smart, but if they see that Associated Press is sending out a tweet which has a couple of keywords like explosions, White House, Obama, injured, even a bot will figure out that this is bad news, right? <laughs> right? So here's the New York Stock Exchange stock ticker for the day of the tweet. This is where the t tweet comes out. Boom. And then it recovers immediately. But still, one tweet, 140 characters. That's remarkable. And the same guys have been hacking tons of other places. Basically, all the main media uh, organizations have been hacked. Uh, most important of them, of course, being The Onion. <laughs> so what about then the surveillance? 
the fact that we are all being watched. We all carry surveillance gear on us, something that tracks our movement and location at all times. Our internet connections are being monitored and tracked by various players. Obviously, um, there's all this surveillance and tracking being done by companies like Google and Facebook. Isn't it funny how Google runs this massive, large, huge, very expensive operation? They have data centers around the world. Um, even just the electricity bill for Google last year was over $100 million. Just for the electricity to run Google.com and YouTube.com and Google Maps and Gmail. Just the electricity. And forget everything about the actual servers and, and, and all that. And at the same time, we know that all these services are free. Like, you pay nothing for YouTube. You pay nothing for Gmail. You pay nothing for Google search. So you would think that if somebody runs such a massively large operation, such a massively expensive operation, and the service is free, such a company should be making huge losses. But Google isn't making huge losses. Google's revenues last year were over $50 billion. That's $50,000 million. They make billions in profit every quarter. That's a really weird combination. A, a, a very expensive service, which is free and very profitable. Funny, isn't it? And of course, the answer is, and we all know this, it's the fact that we sell our privacy to Google. Google profiles us to be able to provide and sell us to the advertisements people. But Google doesn't want to hurt us. They need us. They need us, the users. They are not really in the business of, of hurting us. They are just trying to extract as much as they can out of us without alienating us. Because if we, if we really get angry, we will leave. Right? So Google and Facebook, while they, yes, they do surveillance and they profile us, they aren't probably the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the governmental surveillance. Programs like PRISM. And when the leaks started in June, um, we were sort of expecting all these things to happen. But still, it's one thing to suspect that something like this is going on, and completely another thing to learn that actually it's going on for real. And I was surprised about many of the details that have been released during these leaks over these five months. Like the fact that US government is infiltrating standardization bodies for the purpose of sabotaging encryption algorithms on purpose. Like, what the hell? Like, we take something, an encryption algorithm, which is secure, which is uncrackable, which is so good that if you encrypt one email with that algorithm, and even if you throw every single computer on the planet into cracking that one email, it's still going to take millions of years. So it's uncrackable, perfect security. We take something which is perfect and we make it less secure on purpose, making all of us less secure as an end result. That's remarkable. And you could, of course, understand why they're doing it. I mean, they've been, they've been given a task. Your task is to do signals intelligence. And they're going to do that no matter what. They're ready to, to make us all more vulnerable to reach their goals which is sort of really short-sighted for, for all of us. Or you take something like Skype. Skype used to be secure. Skype used to be end-to-end -end encrypted. I send you a message over Skype. It's encrypted on my end, decrypted at your end, wholly encrypted all the way through. Then Skype is sold to the United States of America, and it's made less secure on purpose. They actually break the secure operation of the system. And now it can be intercepted in the morning. When the leaks started, US government and UK government immediately started playing the defensive game that, you know, it's just, it's the war on terror. We're trying to fight the terrorists. You shouldn't worry about this. It's okay. Then it was revealed that they're actually using these same technologies to monitor United Nations headquarters or EU headquarters in Brussels. And I don't think they're trying to find terrorists at the EU headquarters in Brussels, right? So it's not about the war on terror. Then they were like, okay, it's, it's, it's okay. We only, we, only, we only monitor the foreigners. That's fine. 
No, it's not fine, because I'm a foreigner. You're all, almost all of us here are non-Americans. All of, all of us here are foreigners to the United States people. In fact, 96% of the planet are foreigners. <laughs> then their defensive claims that, you know, everyone's doing this. All the countries have intelligence agencies, you know, we're doing not, nothing different. Well, that's bullshit as well. Because no other country has the visibility the United States has. Because we all use American services all the time. We all run Windows or OS X or iOS or Android. We use Google, Facebook. We use SkyDrive, iCloud, Dropbox. They're all in the United States. How many US politicians and business leaders use Hungarian cloud services daily? The answer is zero, none of them. How many Hungarian politicians and business leaders use US-based cloud services daily? Every single one of them. Every one of them. So it's completely unbalanced. That's the Utah data center, which is due to open next month, which will store massive amounts of data. How much? How much data? Well, let me visualize it. It's a data storage center, so it's going to be filled with hard drives. The building is big. Imagine the largest IKEA you've ever been to. This is five times larger. How many hard drives can you fit in an IKEA, right? It's pretty big. And when the slides about the timeline of, pro, uh, of companies entering the prison program was released, I really tried understanding this slide because all these companies um, say that they aren't participating in this program, yet we have even dates on when they joined the program. Like Microsoft joined on the 11th of September 2007. Skype joined on the 6th of February 2011. So we, we know even up to the date on, on, on how this happened. And I really couldn't come up with an explanation on how, how both of these things could be true. But indeed, they are part of the program, but they aren't part of the program. And I think we have an answer, because two weeks ago, um, there was a leak published in Der Spiegel in Germany about the Operation Socialist, which wasn't done by NSA, which was done by a unit called NAC inside GCHQ, which is British intelligence. And three slides were released, and these slides blow my mind, because they casually speak about this program, of which the target is to hack on a company, a company called Belgium, which is a company in Belgium, which is a telco, an ISP, and a phone operator, and actually provides uh, connectivity, for example, to the EU, EU Parliament. And the slides describe this program as an everyday occurrence. Okay, this program is about gaining access to Belgium. We have these teams which have been arranged. This is our focus. The operation managers have been assigned for different teams. Um, they don't mention anything about the team building party, but I'm sure they have one, one like that as well. Main focus is to enable CNE access to Belgium. CNE, computer network exploitation. So that it's about hacking into a fellow EU member country. A EU country it's intelligence hacking into a company in another EU country. What the hell? They speak about how to do this, gain access to VPNs, identify the key staff working in this target company. They even have this cliche clip art about like success is waiting for us. Let's, let's do this together. It blows my mind. Belgium, of course, is angry about this. EU parliament is angry about this. This is from a Belgium press release, which they put out two weeks ago. The company has filed. A complaint against an unknown third party. It's not an unknown third party. It's the GCHQ in the United Kingdom. So this guy is a pretty powerful guy. For a high school dropout, a very powerful guy. That is he a hero or is he a traitor? And I don't have an answer for that. I'd like him to be a hero. I'd really like... Edward Snowden to be a hero who sacrificed himself to save us. However, I think it's too early to make the call because there are some disturbing details in the whole story which bother me enough not to make the call 
yet, but he is a very powerful man. Almost as powerful as this man in many ways. But this man isn't the most powerful man on the planet. Because the most powerful man on the planet is this guy, better recognized maybe in his business suit. Four-star general Keith Alexander, the director of the NSA, the chief of the Central Security Service, and the commander of the US Cyber Command. He is the most powerful man on Earth. Thank you very much.